I have a confession to make. You see, I've been having a shameless love affair with film. It's true. I love film. I love everything about it. The tones, the grain, the contrast, all without having to do anything in post-production. So whilst the intro there was a little dramatic, it is largely true. Whilst I don't want everything to look like it was shot on portrait, I do find myself aesthetically drawn to its distinctive qualities. Qualities that I'm sure can be easily replicated in Lightroom, but the point is, when I do want that look, I want it straight out of the camera. And that goes for both stills and video. It also means I need to carry two cameras, one loaded with film and the other to shoot video, which then needs to be edited to make it look like it was shot on film. But what about if there was just one camera that did everything? as wallet friendly and convenient as my trusty old M50, but capable of producing images that genuinely look like they were shot on film if I needed it to. Enter the Fuji X-T100. This little retro style powerhouse has the likes of Canon's M50 lined up firmly in its sights. It has a vary angle flip out screen for vlogging, 60 frames a second 1080p video for a tasty semi slow motion, and Fuji's legendary film simulation modes that means Yes, in theory, I can give video the aesthetic look of film. Is this then the camera we've all been waiting for? It's time I stopped making it look like an Aston Martin on Top Gear and booked some travel. Now, I'm flying Ryanair, which means that unless I want to pay many extra pounds for the privilege of taking clothes with me on this trip, I'm able to fit everything I'm allowed neatly inside one pair of pants. So, after a short flight that turned out to be the same price as an artisan flat white, I figured it's time to test this camera the only way we know how. With some sexy B-roll. Welcome to Gdansk. I'll be honest, I love the design. It feels really good in the hand. This little grip part here as well that actually comes in the box, you can just screw onto the side, absolutely fantastic idea. If every camera manufacturer did that, it would be a beautiful, beautiful thing. It has a decent thickness to it, which just makes it feel reliable and sturdy. This top plate feels like it's made out of metal, which again just makes it feel far more reliable than the average plastic rubbish that you see on most budget cameras. So whilst usability and ergonomics are undeniably very important, at the end of the day it's the footage and the video that it produces that will determine whether this little Fuji actually becomes a good travel camera. I'm interested to see if the Fujifilm simulation modes can give me that sweet filmic goodness without having to do any messing around in Lightroom or Premiere afterwards. However, is it good enough to replace my trusty old M50? And the answer is no. I'm interested in the Fuji because I thought it might give me something that was previously unobtainable. The look of film while shooting video. So the short travel film you saw earlier was shot on the profile Classic Chrome, which seemed to have the most pleasing characteristics, or at least be close to what I'm after. However, as far as I'm concerned, it's not even close. Fuji have tried very hard with this camera to enter the YouTube filmmaking vlogging space in the market. And to some extent, they've really excelled. The very angle screen on this camera is genuinely the best iteration of this I've ever seen, period. 
Also, the amount of manual dials and customizable controls on this camera is phenomenal. But it's like they attended a focus group of vloggers, but then got distracted by the free food on offer. For example, the mic jack. Just why? Why not make it the proper size? Because 90% of vloggers' microphones are made by Rode. And all Rode mics have a standard jack, not the fiddly small one, which requires now an adapter in order to be able to use it with this camera. If Fuji are going to line the M50 and A6000 up in their sights with cameras like the X-T100, then they need to take these things more seriously. Another example is that the record button is excellently placed next to the shutter release, but every time you want to use it, you have to hold it down for a few seconds before it wakes up and realises that you actually want to record something. There is also no dedicated movie mode, which means it starts to record in the settings that you were previously using in your stills mode. For example, we all know that to achieve the 180 rule in filmmaking, the shutter should be set to twice that of your frame rate. However, if you're constantly switching between shooting stills and video, it means you're going to constantly have to change those settings to match whatever it is that you're doing. The only way I managed to get around this was to leave manual mode set so that the shutter was twice my frame rate and then shoot all my stills using aperture priority mode because thankfully at least it remembers the settings for each mode that you are in. However, this is still a hack and if things were done properly, you wouldn't have to have these hacks. You get everything framed up nicely, hit record and then suddenly it zooms in throwing your framing completely out. This is definitely not a filmmaker's camera. And if you are interested in this camera for video, then it's probably not long before you start to think about the dark art of vlogging. The in-camera audio is pretty terrible, but then if you easily forget that small adapter to attach an outboard microphone, this is all you've got to work with. The face detect autofocus system seems to hold onto my ugly mug pretty well, even when it's moving around. Hold up, let's rewind here. I think I spoke too soon, because as soon as I loaded this footage into the timeline, I realised that over half of it was out of focus. It happened again and again and again. This is definitely nowhere near as reliable as some of its competitors. So to sum up then, this really does feel like Fuji's first foray into filmmaking. They have all the right ideas, but none of them implemented very well. This camera is confused. It sits somewhere in between wanting to be the M50 and the ultimate vlogger's dream and being taken seriously as a proper stills camera like its older brothers, the X-T2 and maybe even the X-T20. And although I could have forgiven this camera some of these shortcomings, if the Fujifilm simulation mode gave me that filmic look that I desired straight out of camera for both film and video. However, for me it really fell short of the mark. The film simulations on this camera, at least, look like more of a gimmick than an actual professional artist's tool. And it's certainly not as proficient as some of its rivals, like the Sony a6000, a6300, or indeed the Canon M50. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.